Welcome to episode 236 of the Various and Sundry Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Harmon, joined live from our virtual studio on the internet by my good friend, my colleague, my co-host, and the man who is once again conferencing, John Scott Sloat. Doc, what's happening? Well, what's happening is you're on the road again. I am, and I'll be in the road on two more weeks too. So I'll I won't be on next week. I'll be home, and we'll record in person. But the following week, I'll be on the road. It's it's tough being uh, Johnny Tarmac here. It's 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 a tough life. Yeah, I'm I'm telling you what though. By the time July ends, it'll be May, June, and July. We'll have two weeks on the road each month, and. Uh, that's not a great pace for me. I like the one week on the road a month. That's yeah. nice. This yeah. two weeks on the road, it's for the birds. It's yeah. not great. It's not great. It's not so. Great. So where are you joining us from? Um. Well, I I I actually commandeered Zach in Ohio's office. Yeah. Um, so I'm in I'm in the inner inner sanctum. Of, I, I I thought there was a little extra Shekinah glory just yeah. <laughs> kind of uh, emanating from the room. So yes, and he's pretty up to date on podcast listening because he he referenced uh, oh. the last podcast. So maybe we need to get him a sign like various and sundry was here or you know something <laughs> like that for his office. Yeah, I mean if we had merch we could hook him up, but we don't. So, um, yes. Well, uh, and why are you at uh, in Zach in Ohio's office? Uh, there's a uh, Karis Fellowship conference this week, so I am That's attending right. that conference, hearing some papers being read, hearing some preaching, talking to folks, getting coffee, getting breakfast, stuff like that. Yeah, nice. Very nice. Yep, hobnobbing with all the important people. I hobnob. I hobnob like no other. Meanwhile, I'm just a lowly faculty person slaving away in my home office. Mm -hmm. Write that book, crack the whip. Write that book. (laughs) That's exactly right. Um, All right. Well, if you would like to get in touch with the show, you can reach us on X at VNS pod. You can email the show, various and sundry podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook and on YouTube. And we would love for you to leave a five-star rating and a review all right john let's uh let's go ahead and jump right to sports even though there's not much to talk about in the world of sports yeah not a whole lot going on uh do you want to start with uh your beloved mets yeah the mets are in the midst of a road trip uh they're probably 500 on this road trip they're playing as we speak at 1 14 monday afternoon and uh in pittsburgh so uh maybe some have updates from that score uh, as uh, <laughs> as the episode continues, but they're doing all right. They only had one All Star this year, which is is uh, not great. Um, I feel like we should have had three, but we haven't gotten any. So, yeah, trying to trying to uh, trying to make that wild card. So we'll uh, we'll continue to to work. Away. So the All Star break is that next week. I believe that's next week. Yeah. And it comes a little bit past halfway in the baseball season, correct? A um, little over half. So the halfway mark was, I think, this past weekend was the okay. 81st game or whatever. Yeah. Man, but right so now, many. Christian Scott for the Mets has a no-hitter through four innings. There you go. There you go. We'll we'll see if he can hang on to that in the course of this episode. Yeah. Uh, um, have you paid any attention to the uh, international soccer competitions? Nope, I I have not. But this is to go is to go to the Olympics, the Euros to go to the Olympics. Is that? No, they're separate things. Okay, they just happen near the Olympics, basically. Correct. Well, they ha- yeah, they happen every four years in. So they space it. So there's like. <clears throat> The Euros happen, and there's two years later, the World Cup happens, and then so they're spaced out like that. Um, So uh, probably the main reason I'm as uh, invested as I am is uh, I do have, as I've mentioned, a Brit living with us, and uh, England has advanced to the semifinals of the 
Euro Cup competition here. They will take on the Netherlands later this week. Mm. Now, is and, he living it in your basement? Is he is he is he a fanatic? Uh yeah, he's pretty invested. He's pretty invested. So, um, like face paint invested, like not like... face paint, but jersey invested. Okay, okay. Like knows the players on the field and everything. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, he and uh, <clears throat> he and Ben watched the match last Sunday, not yesterday, but the week before. Uh, a match that England had to score in the last minute of stoppage time to uh, stay alive and then subsequently win. Mm. So there was some tense moments here in the Harmon household, which is unusual to be an observer of it, not a participant in it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see how that, how that plays out. Um, I'm trying to think if there's really not much else sports wise going on. Um, that I've paid attention to. I caught a little bit of, uh, actually caught a little bit of NBA Summer League action. The I was other about night. to say, Summer League's going on. Ronnie James is playing with Kyle Mangus. I don't know if you That's saw right. that. right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I saw some, hero. <laughs> saw some minutes of that. So, uh, yeah. Um, wild that, uh, a kid that played that, that our son Jake played with Kyle Mangus in elementary school. Oh, on the same <clears> team. <throat> yeah. Yeah. That's uh, wild. Yep. So wild to see that. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't think there's anything else going on really in sports. Again, we're in the doldrums here. I guess Wimbledon's going on, but I haven't really tracked it. You know, we're not towards the towards the finals yet. Well, and next week's the All Star break, so I mean, the Home Run Derby will be Monday night. All Star games usually Tuesday, and I think they have Wednesday, Thursday off before they come mm-hmm. back Friday. Well, actually, that probably isn't a bad thing, just because our uh, our series that we're in right now is uh, a meaty one. So that gives us more time to talk about that. Okay. So, all right, let's jump in. Let's do uh, it. So we are continuing our series today on the Sermon on the Mount. So last week, we talked about uh, the first 16 verses of, of Matthew 5 largely covering the Beatitudes and the um, uh, the metaphors of being a, a city on a hill, uh, the light of the world, uh, and salt. And so those are where we were last week. Um, now this week, we're taking an even bigger chunk. I don't know that we will read the entirety of it. What do you think, John? We've got 17 through 48. It's 32 verses. No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. Well, I do want to read, though, verses 17 through 20, which kind of set the framework for what follows in the rest of chapter 5. So let's start there. Okay, 17 to 20? Yeah. All right. Well, hold on. Let me scroll to it. All right, 17 to 20, Matthew 5. Uh, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until it is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the king of the in the kingdom of heaven for i tell you unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and pharisees you will not never enter the kingdom of heaven all right okay so um you can argue that these are some of the most uh, challenging verses in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in part because uh, of what Jesus says here and how we're to understand it, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, so in verse 17 there, when Jesus says uh, that he has not come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have come to ab- 
uh, come to fulfill them. Uh, that, of course, is a a, a widely debated um, passage because it's, of course, related to a whole whole complex of other issues when it comes to uh, scripture and theology and that sort of thing. But um, how do you how do you understand what Jesus is saying there when he talks about coming to fulfill them? I have, and I don't know if this is right or wrong, but I've always seen this as sort of uh, uh, Jesus' act of obedience applied to us, right? Right, fulfilling the law, um, the law, its requirements uh, fulfilled and imputed to us is, is sort of how I've always I've always read this. I don't I don't know if that's right. I don't know if that's wrong, but that's that's really how I've taken taken a look at it and tried to understand it. How close am I? Uh, I think you're. I think you're on the right track. Okay. Um, I think that um, the it, it's broader than that, though. I'll put it that way. Okay. So you've got part of what I think is going on there. What's the other part? Um, well, I, I think oftentimes when this verse is read, I think that people miss an important phrase. So when they read that, I think that I think when most people read this and think about this passage. They read it as, do not think that I have come to abolish the law. I have come to, not to abolish the, uh, abolished it, but to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. And they miss the prophets part. Yeah, yeah. I noticed the prophets. Yeah. And so uh, that's why I say there's more than what you're saying. There, what you're saying is there. I just think there's more than that. Because law, law and the prophets is a way of talking about really the totality of the Old Testament revelation. Right. And so it's it, it includes the idea of Jesus active obedience uh on our behalf in our place um but it also the the idea of fulfillment has the sense of filling up the significance of something hmm. and so Jesus is claiming that the that the, the, that the totality of the Old Testament both law and prophets is ultimately fulfilled in him that he is what those realities pointed towards so that every everything that the law and the prophets anticipated he is the fulfillment of that he is the he is what uh what those things were ultimately pointing to all along hmm. which includes uh needing a serpent crusher to uh obey where we have failed so i i would just push it beyond that a little bit uh from what from what you said. What do you make of in verse 18 he goes on to sort of simply it seemingly talk about the law specifically. Mhm. Mm like uh toward the end of verse 18 there he narrow he seems to narrow the discussion. Is that is that a fair? Um, uh yes. Statement? Yeah, I think so. Um yeah, he does specifically there say uh speaking just about the law, he says um yeah, not uh not an iota or a dot, basically even the smallest character uh, or letter within the law will uh, pass away until all is accomplished. In other words, until it has found its fulfillment in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so he does seem to narrow the focus there. And then it continues in verse 19, where he talks about relaxing one of the least of the commandments and leading others to do so um, is not what he's about. So, um, yeah, I think, of course, you know, the, the this gets into a very complex issue uh, in terms of how do we as Christians relate to the to the law in particular. Um, obviously, the New Testament has plenty of commands. You know, Paul on the one hand can say things like. Uh, you're not under law, but under grace. Yeah. And then in the next breath, say, don't do this, start doing this. Yeah. And so it's not that we're not under moral obligation to obey the Lord anymore. It's that there's been a uh, a fulfillment of the law on our behalf by Christ. And that uh, God gives us instructions on how we should how we should live as God's people. And that's where he's really getting at. 
uh, which part of what's kind of countercultural about what he says here in verse 20 is to say, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, of course, in, in Jesus' day, those were the religious experts. Those were the, yeah. you know, the people most uh, most highly regarded for their uh, obedience to what the law said. I mean, the Pharisees, that was their whole shtick, was um, ensuring meticulous obedience to the law. Mm-hmm. And they were so committed to that that they even created additional rules and regulations as a sort of fence or a safeguard around the law. So to to use an analogy, it would be like um, going to the Grand Canyon and, you know, you go to a, to a, to an edge and they often have, you know, a, a fence or some sort of barrier. So you can't get close enough to the edge to fall over and, and die. Well, that's what the Pharisees were attempting to construct were barriers so you wouldn't even get close enough to violating the law. So they back it up a little bit um, and sort of intensify the, well, if the Old Testament says you can't do this, we're going to back it up and say you can't even do things that might be remotely related to this to Hmm. safeguard the, uh, the, uh, the, the law itself. And they're still doing that to a certain extent, right? I mean, the 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 Jewish people are still uh, in in certain in certain places. Like, I know I was in Queens. Not, uh, oh gosh, I guess that was over a year ago now. But they they told us about how they read the law, they read the scrolls, they read all these things, and then they try to set up rules so that they don't break um, that law. Yeah, including yeah. like, when is it stealing if you find money on the street? Like that was amply kept using. You find mm-hmm. 20 bucks on the street. When is it stealing um, to pick it up and take it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, um, and again, I think that's, I think it's always good when we talk about contemporary Judaism to remind ourselves there's many different sects of sure. Judaism so that you have wide ranging uh, variations of of observance and that kind of thing. Uh, but, I think before I, it is easy today to kind of look down our noses at the Pharisees. Mm-hmm. They're an, they're an easy target, um, but I think it's in the interest of fairness. We should at least recognize that I think their intention was often good in terms of a desire to want to keep God's law. And so we can we can criticize many different things, but we need to be careful that we're not that our criticism doesn't just land on, well, gosh, they were just so concerned about obeying God. Well, so should we be, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that that's something that we as Christians should be concerned about obeying God. The issue is, especially in the context, as as the examples that Jesus uses are going to show, um that they were focusing on external compliance rather than heart level posture and obedience. And I really think that's, that's what sets up what follows here in the rest of chapter five, when you have Jesus addressing a number of topics uh, and all of these are introduced with some variation of you have heard that it was said, and then he quotes either an Old Testament command or some sort of expectation, and then he follows it with, but I say to you, and then he gives further explanation as to what God requires. Um, and so I want to talk about that just briefly before we jump into some of the specifics, because it's it's possible to misunderstand what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is not rejecting the Old Testament law here. I mm-hmm. mean, that's why we spent a little bit of time talking about that passage before where he talks about, I came to fulfill it. 
So he's not saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the Old Testament says this. <clears throat> I don't believe, I, but I'm saying something radically different. He's not saying something radically different. Indeed, what I think he is doing is he is explaining the heart level intention behind the commands. And so <clears throat> that's why I think he's stressing. So there is there there is some measure of discontinuity, but more discontinuity with how these commands were understood or lived out rather than with the original intention of God's law in the Old Testament. Yeah. Hmm. And could we connect this back to the to the term, and this is a question for you, do we connect this back to the, the word blessed in the Beatitudes, like, um, and see the, as, as he kind of goes through anger, lust, divorce, oaths, and, and think of it, hey, you really, you really want a, a, a blessed life? You know, you know, don't, don't just follow these to the letter, get mm -hmm. to the, get to the motivation, get to the heart behind it. Is, is that sort of the sense through this? Yeah, it's certainly part of it. I mean, I think, one of the constant tactics of the enemy, and you see this back in Genesis 3, is that Satan likes to convince us that God is holding out something good. He's holding back something that it would be good for us. Hmm. You know, you think about in 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 Eden, what does he say to Eve, basically? he First, he questions God's word, and then he rejects God's word and basically says the reason God won't um won't let you eat from that tree is because he doesn't want you to be like him knowing good and evil. In other words, he's holding out on you something that would be really good for you. Yeah. And God just doesn't want to give it to you. So the path to the good life, the path to um greater joy, greater satisfaction, greater contentment, greater security is this path that that he's laying out. And that's essentially, I think, against the backdrop even here, not that there's an illusion or an echo here, but the idea is that when God gives commands, he does it for our good. And it is a way of him saying the blessed life is a life that is lived within the parameters that God establishes. Mm -hmm. And that goodness and blessing and human flourishing are not to be found outside of those boundaries as much as we might think they 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 could be. Hmm. Interesting. Well, so, how, how do you want to tackle this? Do you want to tackle, you just want to talk about <laughs> each one, one at a time, or, or how do you want to well, proceed? I mean, we've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, really. So um, let's hit them quickly and then we'll we'll linger. Okay. We won't read them, but basically, so the first example that Jesus gives, I'll just read the first part of it, verse 21. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Okay, so he's he's basically extending the commandment against murder to a heart-level disposition of anger yeah, or hate and hatred. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, I, I'm glad that we live in a culture where that's not relevant and, uh, you know, has no application for today since we live in such a kind and gentle social media culture and political culture and social culture where nobody oh, says yeah. mean, nobody says awful things and nobody says hateful things. Yeah. So let's move on uh, to the next one then, <laughs> uh, because our culture also doesn't have a problem with the next one. Yeah. Yeah. But before we do move on, I, I will say, <laughs> um, you know, one of the one of the things that 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 Jesus helps us see about the about the commandments is that the commandments are not just about don't do this, but they generally also point towards the doing the opposite, proactively doing the opposite. So it's not just don't do this, don't hate. But 
the opposite of that is love. Yeah. So the idea of loving uh, others, which he actually is going to get to <clears throat> at the end of this same section when he talks about loving your enemies, but that it's not enough to just um, avoid hatred. The idea is we should actively pursue loving our neighbor, loving others, speaking and acting and even having a heart disposition uh, directed towards others in love rather than in hatred or envy or bitterness or those kinds of uh, very human emotions. Well, and it, the the passage here doesn't assume that in the kingdom of heaven there won't be uh, any of this sort of strife or struggle between between humans, right? Like it, it clearly thinks there's going to be go, going to be struggle, but mm -hmm. um, pursuing that reconciliation, like right. looking for that ability to come together, uh, uh, humble yourself, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, pursue the 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 peace. Um, that will lead to um, what we have in the first part. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In the, in this sort of, and it's, it's a passage like this that also helps us to see that this, this is Jesus description of how we should live within the kingdom. And it's, it's this world oriented. Mm -hmm. It's not like oriented towards the ultimate new creation where all these sorts of things will be gone. All yeah. the sorts of strife and and hostility and those sorts of things won't exist, but they exist in the overlap between the inauguration of the kingdom and the consummation. That's the that's the context in which we live, and so uh, this Jesus is 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 explaining that it's not enough just to avoid not physically hurting or killing someone, but not even having a posture of hatred. Instead, as he'll make clear later in the passage having a posture of love towards people. All right, uh, next one, lust. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And then he goes on to take uh, talk about drastic action to avoid it. But um, yeah, so... When you see this this commandment, this explanation, what is it that stands out to you? Um, I mean, it's kind of kind of the same as the last one. It's kind of like, yes, there's sort of big overarching rule. You know, this one happens to be one of the Ten Commandments, right? Um, however, let's drill down a little bit and get to the heart level. That mm -hmm. that seems to be the uh, the main thrust here. Yeah. Well, and, and here's the thing, too, and this is part of what it applies actually to the previous verse or previous section, is that from the outside, you can't always tell when a person has these sort of heart level violations of God's law. Yeah. Like, you can't look into somebody's heart and see, oh, there's hatred. Oh, there's lust. Now, sometimes you can because uh, it manifests itself outwardly and openly, but you can't always you can't always assess that. And so, it's also a reminder that that, that the righteousness in view here is not something that's just between uh, that's just on a horizontal level. It's not just I have to make sure that for the sake of the community nothing bad happens and there's human flourishing because I'm not taking any action on it, but God sees the heart. Yeah. God knows when there's the hateful thought or the lustful thought. And it's pretty, it's pretty striking how seriously he encourages us to take this when he talks about, I mean, it is hyperbole, but we, we need to be careful about not uh, gutting it. Right. When he talks about if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out and throw it away. Um, if your uh, right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And, you know, I, I think it is pretty clearly hyperbole. And mm -hmm. yet we, we need to be careful about gutting it of its of its power and say, oh, it's just hyperbole. Well, that doesn't mean that he's saying ignore it or treat it lightly or flippantly. It, like The idea is take drastic action. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's the, it's, it's, I think it's kind of captured by the, by the old John Owen uh, statement, uh, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's that sort of, sort of idea. Or, or the John Piper make war. Have you ever seen that sermon clip where he just starts screaming, make war over and yeah. over again? Yeah. Yeah. Classic Piper. Uh, next one, divorce, verse 40, uh, 31. It was also said, when, uh, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, do you see this as an extension of the previous paragraph with lust? Because up until the, so here's my question about this one. Uh, up until now, the first two have been connected to a Ten Commandments, one of the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. This one is not. No. And the next one is. Yeah. So uh, do you see this one connected to, like, almost like a, hey, let me go one level more on lust and adultery and talk about divorce. It, what do you think? Uh, maybe. Uh the next one you're talking about oaths. Oaths is not um that's swear not... falsely. I was thinking lying, bearing false false witness. Yeah. Though that's more I don't think that's directly re directly oriented to one of the Ten Commandments. I think it's more oriented towards a, a prohibition in Leviticus 19. Mm. But in any case, uh, it is curious that you go from adultery or to uh, to divorce. Obviously, those two things are often connected um, and even makes the exception here um, in terms of allowing divorce under those circumstances. Um, I think I think Jesus is just responding to and there's plenty of evidence in the in Jewish rabbinic sources that probably date back to around this time in terms of traditions about um, easy divorce kind of thing, where if a woman does something like burns the dinner, the husband can divorce her kind of thing. Like basically, I think that's more what Jesus is speaking towards is the permanence of marriage, the 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 beauty of marriage when it's viewed that way. And the, the the covenant nature of it as a reflection, ultimately, of his relationship with his people. Hmm. All right, we do need to move on. Otherwise, we're never going to get through this. Oaths. Verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, whether by heaven for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And then he concludes with basically, let your yes be yes, and let that settle it. So what do you think is going on here in terms of what, what what is he trying to get at? Yeah, I mean, this one's a little bit different where it's, hey, don't take, don't take any oath. Um, and it's not like, it, yeah, it's... Uh, Gosh, uh, it's it's just don't swear at all. Don't 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 go to extreme lengths in your conversation. Basically, you know, you know, it's uh, mm -hmm. don't you know, don't swear by the beard of Zeus or you you know or any anything like that. But but just yes, no. Um, well, yeah, I, I think I think ultimately what Jesus is saying is that we should be such truthful people that we don't need that, to do those things. that we don't that we don't need to swear an oath. For people to see both the seriousness and the veracity of what we're saying, because mm -hmm. generally that's when people swear an oath when when they're when they're when they're saying something that you may not believe or that you're like, really? Are I'm not sure. Like, no, no, no. I swear, I swear that that's true. It's and really what 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 Jesus is saying there is you should be such a truthful and honest person that. You shouldn't need to, because people will know by your character that what you say is true, and they can that you can be trusted and relied on. Next one, retaliation. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. If anyone 
slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And he goes on. So, uh, yeah, the what do you what do you make of this specific um, commandment that Jesus gives here? Um. Yeah, I I think there's um. I I think Jesus is trying to get us not not to make rash decisions in retaliation, right? Sort sort of this like. Well, you know, you took my eye, I get your eye, or, you know, you cut off my hand, I cut off in and sort of this sort of rage and anger and trying to get us to, uh, think differently about it. Think, um, I'm, I'm not a pacifist. So, so I, I, I don't automatically go like, well, yeah, we should do this in every situation, you know, where we get mm-hmm. hit in the face and we give them the other side to hit, um, I, I think I know very few people that would actually um, practice that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, this this one's... Uh, anyway, go ahead. I, I do think there there is a distinction between personal and sort of uh, corporate level issues at play here, right? I think mm-hmm. he's speaking uh, personally. And in terms of the sort of corporate level... I don't think he's saying, you know, a a a a nation or a group should never uh, respond uh, with violence to uh, a person uh, putting uh, acting violently towards you, right? I think it's the disposition of instead of uh, seeking our own retaliation. You know, I would tie it to Romans twelve, where you know. Paul basically says, leave room for the wrath of God. Yeah. He's like, you know, you can entrust yourself to God ultimately enacting final justice. Uh, and then the last one, love your enemies. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Um, it, there may... I, you might be hard pressed to come up with a more countercultural uh, <laughs> statement in the in 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 here than than that one. I mean, you might find them, but that's certainly not something that is uh, in step with our culture. Yeah, yeah, this certainly uh, rubs against the tribalism uh, nature mm-hmm. of our culture for sure. Yeah, and that doesn't mean that we don't, you know share our views clearly or even explain when other people we think are wrong. Um, but a lot is, a lot is determined by one's posture, right? If it's spoken out of love, Mm -hmm. out of concern for the truth. Yes. Not as a, as a, uh, sort of attempt to gotcha or to prove one's own superiority. Um, but I, I want to, I want to make sure that we, hit this last part before we wrap up um when he when he says verse 48 you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect so how have you traditionally understood that um yeah i mean uh, measuring ourselves against other people we can actually look pretty good um but when we measure ourselves against uh you know god himself we we <laughs> We obviously don't look uh, uh, as good. Uh, in mm-hmm. fact, we look we look pretty terrible. So that's that's generally how I've understood that. You know, in the in forty seven, um, he talks about don't the Gentiles do that? You know, don't don't even the worst people do that? You know, uh, sort mm-hmm. of an idea. So that's how I've read that. Yeah, I think I would probably take it beyond that and and link it back to uh, verse. 20 when jesus says if uh that uh, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and pharisees you will never enter the kingdom of heaven yeah that i think part of what jesus is trying to do in this section is to help us see that the kind of righteousness we need to get into the kingdom <clears throat> is not something we're capable of producing ourselves mm. it's it's something that is a righteousness that is beyond our reach. Not that we 
are let off the hook, but ultimately it's something that we are incapable of achieving ourselves. And that, of course, raises the question then of, well, how do we get it? How, how do we get this kind of righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees? How is it that we can be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect? And that's, I think, helping to set the stage for what Jesus himself accomplishes for us on our behalf through his life of perfect obedience and his uh, sacrificial death on the cross. So it's, I think it's a both and. So some people will say, well, see, oh, Jesus just says these things so that we see our need for him. Well, that's true, yeah. but he still expects us to try to obey this. Like yeah. he, he doesn't let us off the hook. And what's not talked about here, because it's not necessarily uh, appropriate for this point in redemptive history, as Jesus is talking about this, is he's going to give us his spirit to empower us to obey in a way that uh, the Pharisees and the scribes were unable to. Mm. Well, I feel like we just scratched the surface on that. Yeah, yeah. It felt like we moved really quickly through that. And I imagine this this Sermon on the Mount uh, series that we're talking through will feel like we're breezing through it quickly. Yeah. But, I mean, selfishly, what I hope is that that will encourage people to dig in a little bit deeper themselves and to to read through it and go, oh, well, they didn't even talk about this. You're yeah. right. We didn't because we're trying to cover 30... 31 verses in about uh, 24 minutes. <laughs> We're on a time crunch. That's right. That's right. Speaking of time crunch, I think it is time now for This Day in Sports History. All right, This Day in Sports History, by the 9th. July 9, 2024. The just flying by here. Yep. Um, school year be, will be here before you know it. Uh, 1948 on July 9th, Satchel Paige at 42 debuts in major in the majors, pitching two scoreless innings for Cleveland in St. Louis. That's great. Yeah so, yeah. so obviously his career spent largely in the Negro Leagues because uh, African-Americans weren't permitted in Major League Baseball. Um, 1968. 20 years later, Wilt Chamberlain becomes the first uh, reigning NBA MVP to be traded the next season when he moves from Philly, uh, the 76ers, to the Los Angeles Lakers. Wilt the still. Uh, big fella, Wilt. Yeah. I had a joke that I was going to share, with, but I can't share it on pod. So let's oh. move on. Okay, nineteen. Uh, New Zealand cricket legend Richard Hadley uh, takes a 5-53 to 53 in the third test versus England at uh, Ed, Ed, Edgbaston. I don't know if I got that right. To end test career with 431 wickets. That's an impressive feat. Really I don't impre- think anybody can deny how impressive that is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 2000, police fired tear gas at fans during a World Cup qualifying soccer game, uh, soccer match probably, uh, between Zimbabwe and South Africa, setting off a stampede that killed 12 people in Harare, Zimbabwe. Yeah, it's it, it's just different. Soccer is just different around the world compared to American sports. And I, like, you know, we we... We like to think that like college football fans are rabid and crazy and they are to some extent, but you know, it's a whole nother level when you get to international soccer. Oh yeah. Uh, 2001 Wimbledon men's tennis, three-time runner up Goran, uh, Ivanisevic. I don't know if I got close (laughs) to that. Even even Ivanisevich. I don't think I'm that far off. Uh, wins his lone major (laughs) title beating Patrick Rafter of australia nice so yeah even even isevich was a like he's like six 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 seven really russian? tall left left hander uh not russian i think he was russian i think he was some sort of eastern european okay uh 2017 high amateur uh Athaya uh, Titakul, 
I don't know if I got that <laughs> remotely close. Becomes the youngest winner in a female professional golf event at 14 years, four months, and 19 days at the Ladies European Thailand Championship. Oh, boy, that's a weird sentence. Uh, European Thailand Championship. Yeah. So basically, this young Thai woman won a golf tournament, a professional golf tournament. Nice. Yeah. Well, Doc, what do you like here? Um, I'm tempted to go with Satchel Page. That's who I was thinking. I like Satchel Page. All right. Satchel Page, it is. One of the best baseball players who ever lived. Yeah. One of the best. One thing you liked. All right. So I am nearly finished with a book uh, that I've been reading and that has been really good. I've learned a lot. It's challenged some assumptions I've had. Um, and it, it's just been really good. But the, the name of the book is Black Liberation Through the Marketplace. Um, making arg And it makes arguments that uh, slavery in Southern America was not a free market and slavery hurt the economy of the South because of slavery. Mm -hmm. Jim Crow hurt the South's economy because of slavery and uh, how liberation uh, came uh, to uh, Black Americans was uh, through places where the free market thrived, uh, like Tulsa, things like that. And when they had strong civil institutions like the black church or, um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the foundation that, uh, Booker T Washington started. I mean, it, it's a fascinating read. Uh, mm -hmm. so it would, uh, definitely some, you read some atrocities in there where you're just like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that happened. Um, yeah. and you also read some stuff where you're like, oh, I didn't, I did not know about that. And that's really cool. Um, mm -hmm. or things like that. Also a good primer on classical liberalism in there too. Uh, do you remember who the author is? Uh, Rachel Ferguson. Hmm. Okay. Was this a book you picked up at uh, Acton or did you, were you reading it before? I picked it up at Acton and I went to a session with Rachel Ferguson. Okay. So, um, she was fun to listen to. Okay. All right. So, uh, my one thing I liked is, uh, this past week. We had our good friends, the Cornells, in town. Nice. So, Is this Rich? Yeah. Yeah. Ah. So Rich and Lori, yeah, they were, they came up, uh, they were here July 4th, 5th, and 6th. So it was fun to hang out with them. And um, we we introduced them to pickleball. They had never played pickleball before. They obviously heard of it, but not played it. I uh, I have never played pickleball either. Really? Yeah, have not played. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I I, I think you'd enjoy. It. Did you ever play tennis? Um, just recreationally, never, never. Yeah. like a, a set tournament or anything like that. Just smacking around with friends or whatever. But yeah, I, I mean, it's a hybrid between tennis and ping pong. Like, you know, I I think you'd be fine at it. Um. Maybe that's a fun little uh, date activity for you and uh, you and Andrea. We've we've talked about it. We would have to. I know there's. They just put in a big pickleball place in Fort Wayne. I'm sure it's not called a place, but um, <laughs> uh, a pickleball facility. So there's a big indoor pickleball facility that just went up in Fort Wayne. Something like 20 courts or something like that. Well, I, I don't know if we're talking about the same thing, but there used to be a place called the Spice Field House which was a, a basketball courts, like probably eight basketball courts. And they would host tournaments for travel basketball, hmm. AAU stuff and that kind of thing. Well, about two years ago, they basically replaced all of the basketball courts with pickleball courts. Oh, funny. Huh. Yeah. That may be the same place. So How it many... might be. Yeah. It, it, could, many... it, it could be 20. Like, I mean, it, a, a normal basketball court, you could fit at least two, hmm. depending on the size of the of the basketball court. Maybe three uh, pickleball courts on that. So, hmm. but uh, 
yeah, you'll have to try it. Uh, but they introduced us to a new card game that my wife is now an addict to. You ever heard of the card game called Swoop? No, no, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of hard to hard to describe. It's relatively simple to play, but two decks of cards, and you start off with 18 cards, and you have to try to get rid of all your cards to win, and there's rules involved with that. And so hmm. um, it's my my wife is now addicted. Uh, I enjoyed it, even though I was not very good at it. Um, so, yeah, but great to see the Cornells. They're a lot of fun. Um, if it wouldn't have been July 4th weekend, and I and if you'd have been on campus on the 5th, I, I probably would have said, let's get in the studio and record an episode with Rich. Yeah, but I know we've talked about that in the past, and that, that would be a lot of fun. Someday. I mean, we could always do it virtually, but, you know, in person is just a different dynamic. So Yeah, absolutely. That is my one thing I liked. All right, John, we have talked about the Mets. We have talked about the Sermon on the Mount, part two. We have talked about Satchel Page. We've talked about Black liberation through the marketplace. And we have talked about our visit with the Cornells. And so I think, by definition, we have covered our various and sundry topics. And all that's left to say is, until next time, the Lord bless you all real good. Later. Later.